Hello students, welcome to the Kagaku Classroom. Let's jump right in. Our first article of the week is Does High School Popularity Lead to Happiness? In high school, the most popular kids are assumed to be the happiest. More friends equals more long-term happiness, right? This may seem correct, but recent studies suggest otherwise. What matters more, actually, is maintaining close friends over time. It's actually much better to have close friends to be the popular. Youth with higher levels of attachment to their best friends appear to have better psychological health, psychosocial adjustment, and even more adaptive stress response during adolescence, the study author says. In general, adolescents with high-quality close friends report higher rates of overall happiness than those without. I have no idea how you measure happiness. Let's just, just roll with it. Now, to be clear, you can't be popular and still have high levels of happiness. We're not saying you shouldn't try to make friends either. However, the study suggests that closer friends is more important than being popular. This study looked at a group of 169 students over a 10-year period. The participants were asked questions about their anxieties, self-worth, and symptoms of depression to assess their feelings. The study uses data to measure mental health. The students were asked to identify their closest friends, and that friend was also interviewed. To assess popularity, the researchers asked the student body to rank the top and bottom 10 peers they would want to spend free time with. Popularity was then measured by the percentage of most liked ratings. Teens who focus more on peer popularity did not fare with their mental health. The reason why is because these short-term friendships do not have the same positive benefits of long-term reciprocal friendships. So the saying, it doesn't matter how many friends you have, it's how good those friends are, really is true. Are absence-only sex ed programs helping teens in today's day and age? Today, we see that there are many teens choosing or having sex in the U.S. Currently, 46% of U.S. teens are having sex a year. That's almost half the teen populations right now. The question is, why are there so many issues with sex in teens? Because our absence-only programs aren't holding up, we see that it's not delaying the age teens are having sex, but also causing unintended pregnancies and infections. Now, why could this be happening, you may ask? One, teens are curious people, and people have been telling teens not to smoke, but that doesn't seem to be working as we have nearly 23% of teens using tobacco products. If something is a mystery to a kid, they're going to find a way to explore slash answer their own questions. Tell a kid it's dangerous or bad, and they'll find a way to explore it as soon as you turn your back. Anyway, back to the main point. This is showing teens won't always just listen, and that's really all absence-only programs are doing. Now, an absence-only program must be perfect to succeed, and it's not. Absence-only programs fail because they are mainly saying that don't have sex till a certain age. Now, this fails because some teens want to anyway, and without correct guidance and lessons on how to have protected sex, which can lead to STDs. Absence-only programs will continue to be a negative influence if they don't start doing things like comprehensive sex ed programs, which not only teaches absence, but also takes a step further and shows lessons on how to have safe sex correctly, since they already know some teens are going to do it anyway. This is the more effective way, and studies show it works because you're actually showing and teaching the kids how to abstain from sex or what to do if you choose to have sex. It's like taking a class on absence instead of just being told to abstain from sex with no guidance to anything else. Abstinence-only programs are in need of change or they will plummet. Studies like these have provided the same or similar results. Schools really need to get with the program. Other studies have shown that absence-only is actually worse than comprehensive sex ed. Numbers of pregnancies go up while age of sexuality goes down. Why the dinosaurs died a slow, painful death. The Yang Cretaceous extinction makes the most explosive Hollywood disaster movies look like a picnic. The death of three quarters of the population is one of the deadliest extinctions in history. However, without it, it's likely that humans would have never taken over. And then we wouldn't have YouTube. Well, maybe we would have YouTube. But Velociraptor YouTube. Well, while most people accept that the dinosaurs died out by meteor impact, there are still many questions. How lethal was the impact is one of them. A team of geologists have investigated that aspect of this story. In many places on this earth, there is a thin geological layer that was created by the impact that killed the dinosaurs. It contains soot created by wildfires across the world. Estimates put this amount from 750 billion kilograms to 35 trillion kilograms. This suit stayed in the air and blocked out 99% of the sunlight for close to two years. Most photosynthesis ends when there is only 1% sunlight, so most of the plants could not grow. Too bad for those plants, who cares, right? They're just plants, right? Well, if the plants die, then there's no food for the herbivores. Without the herbivore, there's no food for the baby raptors, huh? Not the baby raptors! 
Without the sun, the world fell into a poignant cold. Temperatures dropped by 20 degrees Fahrenheit in the ocean and 50 degrees Fahrenheit on land. Most of the continent would be below freezing for many years. So we got cold raptors. Why am I so obsessed with over raptors? I don't know. The combination of surface cooling and the sewing the air slowed the water cycle, bringing down rainfall by three quarters for about six years. So to recap, we're talking about a dark, frozen, arid earth for at least two years. So basically, Antarctica all over the world. For animals that did survive this event, the effects would actually clear up pretty quickly, with some estimates between five and seven years. If this were to happen with us humans here, the effects wouldn't be as drastic. We have electricity and technology now, and things are more sustainable. The only problem would be providing artificial ultraviolet light to the world to feed the plants. While the sugar tax in Mexico is a big deal, in Mexico there is a controversial tax, a very controversial tax. Companies like Coca-Cola oppose it, but the World Health Organization praise it. It's called a sugar tax. It opposes the tax on sugary drinks like Pepsi, Gatorade, and Red Bull. Recent data suggests that a sugar tax would have positive health benefits. In Mexico, the obesity rate is higher than in the United States, at an overbearing 70%. That means if I met 10 Mexicans, only 3 would be healthy. The survey found that in low and middle income houses, people drink 16% more water. The research also showed a reduction in the amount of sugar sweetened beverages in certain groups. One of those groups are families with children. This is significant because this can help lower obesity down the road and make steps in the direction of overall good health. Other examples of sugar tax would be in the city of Berkeley in California. After the law was enacted, the sale of soft drinks dropped by 10% in one year. The tax raised $1.4 million for the children's nutrition and other community health programs. The World Health Organization supports these laws, reminding us of the ongoing obesity problem we are facing. I don't know about you, but if I had to choose between Coke costing a quarter more or fat kids, I think the answer is obvious. Consumption of free sugar, including products like sugar drinks, is a major factor in the global increase of people suffering from obesity and diabetes, said Dr. Douglas Betcher, director of the World Health Organization's Department of Prevention of NCDs. If government tax products like sugar drinks, they can reduce suffering and save lives. Scientists create deadly cancer-killing nanobots that kill in under 60 seconds. Scientists have created a nanobot that kills cancer. This nanobot is extremely amazing, and research shows it's capable of drilling through the outer membrane of a prostate cancer cell in a range of 1-3 to three minutes, instantly killing it. Studies are showing that they are working on creating ones that have lights, so they're capable of targeting cancer cells, such as ones found in breast tumors or skin melanomas. The best part of the machines are so tiny you can create multiple amounts of them, and they operate very well. They can drill into humans and even animal cells with these machines. These machines can be used medically, and when all is said and done, will be able to save many lives and be a new, new way to treat patients. They can be used for not just killing, but for the treatment of cells, as well as getting rid of any disease or signs of cancers that can be found in a the cell. These machines are extremely advanced and can be very successful. They will be mentioned that they spend at 2 to 3 million times a second. Wow. Amazing. Why alcohol treatment can save some cancer patients. Scientists from Duke University have come up with an ethanol gel that can be used to get rid of tumors. Ethanol is a type of alcohol found in adult beverages. This group has discovered a therapy called ethanol septoablation, which is injected into a tumor to get rid of it. It is used to treat one type of liver cancer and is just as successful as a surgery and the cost is $5 or less a treatment. That means it costs less than get a Jack Daniel. It's not so bad, but it does have its limitations. The treatment only works on tumors surrounded by a fibrous capsule and requires a lot of ethanol, which can cause damage to nearby tissue. It also requires multiple treatments. So like we said, it can save lives, but can be very risky. We hear they are making changes to it, where the injected in tumor, it turns to gel, which has a much greater effect, but still isn't 100% guaranteed. So the question here, is it worth the risk or not? Study shows they have made the substance to where it takes one treatment depending on the tumor, so that they are definitely progressing. That's all the time we have for today. If you like our content, subscribe for weekly science analysis videos, and leave a like if you found this video informative. We have a Discord where you can further discuss articles or share your own with the community, or just have a good time discussing science. We also have a Twitter page where we post daily science facts and give you quick updates on the science world. The link to the Discord and the Twitter page is in the description below. Check them both out, I'm sure you'll be interested. Leave a comment about your favorite article and we'll try to get with you. Thank you for your time and have a nice day.